Great. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, this is our first live stream event, so I will maybe just give people a few minutes to join before we kick, kick off. How are you, Claudia? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I'm a bit hungry, actually, because I haven't actually had lunch yet, so I'm hoping that people watching <laughs> are lucky and have got some food with them. Food for thought, maybe. I like it. Yeah, we have some viewers. Um, we do. In. And some thumbs up already. It's very exciting, all this technology. Shall we kick off? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, firstly, massive welcome to everybody. And thank you very much for, for joining this. Um, in this day and age, it is my first ever live stream event. So I feel very excited about it. And shout out to... Um, Tessa and Katie in our comms teams at our respective organisations for, for having this idea and setting it up. Um, so this is um, a live stream event hosted by the Burkhoff Foundation and Conciliation Resources um, called Together for Change. Um, and we're going to be focusing on gender and peace and gender in peace um, during this discussion. Um, it's to mark International Women's Day, which is upcoming this Friday, the 8th of March. Um, and I'm really delighted to be joined by um, one of my sort of compatriots, or not compatriots, um, one of my partners, I suppose, at the Burkhoff Foundation. So, Claudia, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Esther, and welcome, everyone. I am Claudia Cruz Almeida. I'm project manager at the Burkhoff Foundation at the Negotiation and Mediation Support Department. And I have been working in a that support women in resistance and liberation movement in their participation in peace processes. So looking forward to share some insights together with you. Amazing. Thank you. And it's, yeah, it's really just a pleasure to meet you uh, as well for this chat. Um, and my name is Esther Hodges. So I'm the Senior Gender Advisor at Conciliation Resources. So I'm actually covering a maternity leave for our Head of Gender and Peace Building for the year. So I'm very lucky to be here. Um, and in my role for this year, I'm really here to kind of offer technical advice and guidance to our different programme project teams across the world. Um, and yeah, to continue building relationships and partnerships with the different peace building organisations we work with to kind of push forward, um, work on gender in the peace building space. Um, so I suppose with that in mind, Claudia, kick us off with the first question. Why do you think peace building organisations need to think about gender? Yes, thank you, Esther. I think we have been giving answers about this question for 20, 25 years, maybe even longer than I'm alive. So maybe together we can find on creative answers that uh, we can give to our viewers on why gender should be included in peace building. But from the point of view, from the Berhoff approach, uh, how, the way we have been working around gender is from the point of view of inclusivity. And understanding that for... A peace process to last and to be sustainable, we need to have an inclusion approach. And the reasons to, to be inclusive, uh, we can talk about legitimacy, ownership of the process, for example. But as well, when it comes concretely about gender, mm -hmm. what can guarantee the sustainability of the process as well is thinking about power structures. Who is actually holding the power? who is having the resources, who is taking the decisions. And in that way, we can address the root causes of the conflict and making sure that any agreement that is reached considers, obviously, what were the main causes of why violence started on the first place. So thinking our gender, about power structures, and also thinking our peace in a broader sense, so not just as the absence of, absence of physical violence, yeah. but also thinking about uh, what happens when there is not physical violence, where are the, the people that are marginalized, 
the voices that are not being heard and understanding that that's also a form of violence. So that is why we think that gender should be included in peace building because it's gender inequality is def definitely a form of violence mm -hmm. and should be addressed in, in different ways. But I think that's nothing new. And as well, if we look at the UN Security Resolution 1325, they did a global study of its implementation and they were trying to bring some hard data to this more meta, meta information of why gender in peace building. And they analyzed 40 peace negotiations. And actually they concluded that um, if you include in this case women, let's not, women, gender is not equal women, but in this case in women's participation, uh, the peace process were 20% more likely to last for two years. Mm. And at least 30%, there was an increase of at least 35% of the peace agreement to last for at least 15 years. So there is a correlation there between inclusion and the durability and the sustainability of a peace process. Mm. But mm. those like the arguments and the facts, but maybe for our audience, if we talk a bit more of examples, uh, they can, uh, how this works in practice. So maybe Esther, you have some examples you can uh, give to our audience on when gender actually pays off when incorporating into peace building. Yeah, yeah, thank you for giving that overview as well. I think, yeah, really important, like justice and equality and efficacy arguments for thinking about gender as part of peace building. Um, so I, I suppose at conciliation resources, we kind of, when we're thinking about gender in peace building, there's really kind of two things, I suppose. The first is the thinking, and then the second is the doing. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about the thinking first. Um, so first, it's really important from our perspective to really try and understand a given context. Um, we work really closely with, with partners. So what we often try to do is a really detailed analysis to kind of see in a given context, you know, who and what is driving a conflict, and therefore who and what has the the, the sort of capacity or the, or the opportunity to to drive peace um, and when we're doing that analysis we really think about and we ask gender related questions as part of that to try and understand who the different actors are where they might be coming from um, and how gender is influencing you know their experience of the conflict their that what they're interested in in thinking about peace um, and, and the different gendered uh, causes and effects of that conflict as well. Um, I actually think we've maybe got a couple of our partners on the call, which is really exciting because um, I've got some examples, I think, from, from some of the work that we've done with them when it comes to the doing. Um, so, you know, there's lots of stuff on our website, so I'll just share a couple of illustrative and really, really interesting examples from our work. Um, the first is some work that we've been doing in the Somali regional state um, in Ethiopia, where a comprehensive peace agreement was was reached in 2018. Um, so we'd been kind of working with different conflict parties to reach um, and implement that peace agreement. Um, and then kind of we've also been working with different groups. So that includes women, that includes young people, it includes diaspora communities um, to feed their ideas really into what the peace process and agreement implementation should look like um, and as part of that we've worked with different partners to establish a women's dialogue space which has really created these sort of safe opportunities for for younger women leaders um, and and sort of more experienced leaders as well um, to kind of ensure Somali women's voices are, are heard in the peace process um, and to make sure that there's the opportunity for, for younger leaders to learn from and be mentored by those more experienced and leaders as well. Um, yeah, and we've seen some sort of interesting sort of outcome, maybe, I don't know, I don't want to say it's too much to do with our work necessarily. There are lots of things that feed into these successes, but we're seeing sort of more political engagement for, for women um, in Somaliland um, and in sort of the Somali regional state of Ethiopia as well, um, who are tr trying to secure sort of an increase for votes for women candidates during the sixth national election. So it just kind of is an example of how creating that space for dialogue, for mentorship, for learning, um, can have these kind of long-term impacts for political representation, um, as an example. Um, and then, so I, I actually just got back from a trip to the Philippines, which was just amazing um my first trip with cr and i got to meet so many of our partners which is just so exciting um because they're so oh, there's just so much to like learn from them and from their approach and the way they peace build um 
so we still have worked with them to in, in the southern sort of region of the Philippines in the Bangsamoro region. Uh, we've been been working with them uh, to set up community security working groups, uh, which bring together women, indigenous people, young people, um, and people living with disabilities to resolve sort of ongoing uh, conflicts in the region um, and to help develop better engagement as well with local government. Um, and just an, a, a nice little example from, from that of impact is a community uh, security working group member who, who is a person with disability um, has been able to um, been appointed to the Pers people with disabilities unit in the municipal office and is also chairwoman of women with disabilities in Maguindanao as well. And that's really significant because it kind of platforms, I suppose, um, that skill and that knowledge that she can have um, in sort of building peace within that, within that environment. Um, and I suppose just through both of those examples, what we're kind of drawing out is through the kind of work with partners, you're working not just with with, with women as a homogenous group, and I'll kind of come on to that maybe later, but thinking about people with disabilities, people thinking about age, thinking about all these other sort of characteristics and identities that kind of come together um, and really influence how people experience conflict and, and what they want from peace. Um, so I've met some really amazing women um, recently and, and throughout my career. Um, and they motivate me, but what, who, who, who or what motivates you in, in your role? Um, Claudia yeah like that was the, like two really good examples I kind of put in words to to when we are talking about gender and I really like what you mentioned of like including youth people with different abilities as well so sometimes people don't know what what's gender and uh, we also work in the Philippines in the Bansamoro region we have wonderful partners there and I remember we invited her to a, a conference uh, on feminist approaches to transitional justice and she was telling me after the conference she was like I didn't know that that's what you meant by feminism of course we are all about inclusion we are all about not leaving no one behind yeah. so that points right to the importance of terminology being flexible and I think that's connected to the question of what motivates me um Personally, I think what motivates me is knowing that I don't have all the answers and that working around gender and peace building is making the right questions rather than having the perfect answers. Yeah. And I think working around gender, it's sometimes a complex issue for many people and they are afraid to start and like to say, no, let's not deal with that because it's too complicated. But it's just the matter of reflecting about it and discussing with local partners and with people that think alike, but also with people that are not necessarily convinced. Mm. So in that sense, we are having conversations like, for example, both organizations are completely advocating for including gender in peace building, but it's also important to have difficult conversations to those that are not necessarily convinced about uh, including gender approaches into, into peace building. And in that sense, we also do a lot of work in terms of peace education, and I think working around gender in peace building is also working around raising awareness, having difficult conversations, challenging ourselves and questioning every day, are we leaving anyone behind? Are we forgetting anything? And yeah, trying to be creative. And nowadays as well, I think another motivation will be we have great challenges, such as, for example, climate change. That's a huge challenge. And I think thinking, approaching the topic of, for example, climate change through a gender lens could give us new creative ideas. So that's also another argument of why to be inclusive in peace processes would be because uh, these great challenges that we have nowadays require great ideas. And the more voices we hear, the more people include, the more we are going to be and the better we are going to be prepared for, for these great challenges. Mm. So I would say, like, yeah, that's, I think, what uh, motivates me in this role and having the calm that I don't have the perfect answers and talking like we are doing right now and with our uh, followers and viewers is what we are supposed to, to be doing. And I have another question here as well, and we have greetings from Bansamoro and greetings back there and how do you think we can go about 
promoting the inclusion of women in peace processes because we already talk about the facts. We already talk about the arguments and being creative and power structures, analysis. But maybe you have another ideas that we can give to our, our viewers about this topic. Yeah, well, I'd love to, to hear the views of, of the people on the call on this as well, because I think um, first it's kind of understanding what the barriers are, right? Because we've been, you know, been really, you know, as, as a community of, of peace building organisations and, and women peace builders um, and male allies, I suppose, as well, kind of really trying to think about this this issue for, for years and years and years. And I, and I don't think I don't think we've really cracked it necessarily. Um, so I think really first understanding what, you know, why is that the case? What are the key barriers that, have, that yeah. stop? Um, that's stopping women peace builders from, from being able to have a really meaningful role in peace building processes. And I think there are, you know, there are lots and lots of, of barriers that they face, whether it's kind of, um, you know, financial, as simple as they're not being enough funding out there to kind of really kind of raise and promote their roles. Um, there can be political um, political sort of barriers as well. When, you know, you know, you have in these, what we call in the sector, these kind of track one elite elite processes between political and military elites often they kind of just necessarily exclude women in that those those positions are often held by men um and then you have you know you have kind of really human barriers you, you know the fact that peace builders are often you know they're experts in their own experience and talking about peace building and moving trying to move towards a peace that often often means kind of reliving the conflict or kind of speaking about experience of conflict. And I don't think we should underestimate the psychological burden of, of doing that, especially when, as we really often see in the sector, you know, women peace builders, women mediators don't receive very much remuneration for their work. Um, so they might, you know, they might have to forego a, an opportunity to, to bring some money in to, to earn some yeah. money in work. So, yeah, there are so many barriers. Um, and uh, I think trying to understand those and then trying to, <laughs> trying to sort of tackle them in, in a cohesive way is really important, but also learning from our successes and kind of um, these kind of impressive impacts that, that women mediators, women peace builders manage to have all over the world um, every day, despite the kind of mountain that they have to, to climb. Um, so, yeah. Learning from our challenges, uh, from the lessons learned. And oh, we have a comment here. Um, are there similarities between conciliation resources and pair of work? I think they are, and that is thing why we are discussing here and the importance of complementing each other's works and supporting each other rather than, like, yeah, when we think about peace processes, they are really, um, it requires a lot of financial resources, human resources, time, and mm -hmm. effort. So that is why it's so important to be coordinated when when it comes to doing this, uh, to supporting peace processes and to include gender as well. Because in the long term, if uh, all these resources are invested, but then it's not thought through uh, in a sustainable way in 20 years time, you are going to have the same story, uh, maybe with a different name. So it's going to repeat the assumption, like the possibilities of resumption of violence are... are mm -hmm are more high, are higher. And uh, for example, at Berhof, we have been using a lot uh, the analysis that the, the gender toolkit that conciliation resources have put together about how to go about gender when you are doing a conflict analysis. So that's an example I could come up with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I don't know about you, Claudia, but I find just the kind of network of peace building organisations and gender experts within those organisations, there are many different platforms and ways in which we kind of meet and discuss. And just kind of having that peer support network is really helpful sometimes because, yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff to achieve <laughs> and to try and push and to, uh, to, to push for with gender um, in, in peace building. So having that network of people who are driven and, and experienced and like just motivated and, and brilliant is a really 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 kind of a great way in which organizations like Berkhoff and, and CR kind of work together and try to sort of back each other up I suppose. Um, I'm conscious of time so I know we said we would be about 20 minutes but we've got some interesting questions so and thank you I see some of my Philippines colleagues in the chat which is lovely. Um, yeah I'm just having a trying to sc scroll back yes and there is the comment of uh, a viewer who says 
that uh, gender is key for the success of a uh, peace process is exactly what we were saying. And the importance of without gender equality, it wouldn't be possible to have peace. So mm. in the work around that is important to continue to strengthen the narrative and as yeah. we like adapt the terminology that we will work for each of the context. And indeed, we said we were going to be 20 minutes in life, but this is mm. just the teaser of what we wanted to discuss. There are going to come many resources and content uh, in the media, in both uh, uh, conciliation resources and Berhoff social media channels. So I will advise our viewers to follow us and to get in touch. If you have more questions, we'll be happy here to to answer them. And this was just, as I said, the teaser of how peacebuilding organizations can come together to think creatively on how to incorporate gender in peacebuilding. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. I really appreciate it. And can I just leave with one final comment? Yes. Um, when we talk about gender, even though this is for International Women's Day, we're not just thinking about women. We're thinking about men as well. We're thinking about gender and how it covers lots of different power dynamics and nuances. Um, so when we're thinking about gender, we need to think about really kind of in, in a really nuanced and detailed way. Um, you know, asking questions about how patriarchal is a specific context, what are the key expectations society might have of men and might have of women, and how might that influence their role both in conflict and peace building. So viewers um, and participants as well with your comments, um, if there, are, if there are men in your lives or men in your organisations or other people who, who you think are interested or would be or should be interested in this, please, um, please bring them along to the conversation and get them involved. Yes. Thank you for that last comment, Esther. Then thank you everyone for watching us. And yeah, have a wonderful International Women's Day and a great week to everyone. Thanks, everyone.